welcome everyone. I see everyone starting to join. Uh, we're real excited today to have a, a established, a, uh, assembled a very, very senior um, panel on um, a very, um, very, very niche, niche uh, issue, the DOD budget process, you know. So uh, when people talk about acquisition reform and generally talk about a specific either contracting authority or a way to approach program, at, program development um, or, um, or oversight, but um, a fellow for our center, uh, Mr. Eric Lofgren, who I'll introduce in a moment, has written an ambitious paper around how the, the reform of the DOD budget process will help acquisition, um, uh, the acquisition process. So, and that is sort of the, sub, the, um, the that white paper was uh, sent to you all and will be summarized in a video he's gonna show you shortly. Uh, and then we'll have the discussion with our subject matter experts. Uh, we're very pleased to have Two honorables and a um, and a, and a very senior staffer, um, the former director of Tape, Cape, um, Mr. Bob Daigle, the former assistant secretary of defense for acquisition, the honorable Katrina McFarland, as well as uh, Bill Greenwald, um, former very senior uh, Senate staffer and former deputy undersecretary for industrial affairs. But um, I'm Jerry McGinn, and I'm hosting you all for this discussion on our Center for Government Contracting at George Mason University within the School of Business. So the center, we've, we've been in place for about two years now, and we have three, our vision is to be the uh, a nexus for government, industry, and academia to collaborate and address the business policy regulatory issues facing the half trillion dollar ecosystem in which we all work every day. This is not just contracts, but it's the business and policy regulatory issues, such as budget process. Um, that, uh, that affect that system. And we do that through three lines of efforts, uh, research. So we wanna be a thought leader on these issues. Um, and then education training, we do courses and executive development. We're welcoming back our students at George Mason just these um, last, uh, this week. So we're excited to have students back and collaboration are events like today. So today we're hitting both the research and the collaboration side um, in today's event. So next slide. But uh, today's not our only uh, activity, so we're having another um, uh, event uh, next month, and it's around intellectual property and government procurement. And it also is based on a, a white paper that one of us written by one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Jim Hasek, um, which looked at um, government procurement, um, um, the value of IP in the government procurement of uh, trucks and see, um, see how IP was valued in those competitions. So fascinating discussion. Uh, which we'll uh, do a formal announcement shortly. And then secondly, I wanted to tell you all about the, co the conference we have coming up. We partnered with DAU for our second annual government contracting conference. And the theme is government contracting in a changed world. Um, and because of the uh, COVID situation, we made this virtual and broke in the conference into three modules. The first module is going to be around building resiliency. And we're very, very pleased to have as our keynote for that, the, um, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Mr. Uh, Representative Adam Smith, and then we'll do a fire fireside chat with him. And we're having two, um, in addition to that, two uh, panels on strengthening supply chains and then CMMC implementation. Uh, we're, we're fortunate, we're confirming some of the speakers on those, but we do have the CEO of Huntington Ingalls um, Industries, um, Mr. Mike Petters, as, um, as our, one of the CEOs on the strengthening the supply chain. And then we're, um, we have the vice chair for the uh, CMMC um, um, assessments accreditation board, uh, Carol, Carlton Johnson uh, confirmed, and we're confirming some other folks there. So, so we got events coming up that you'll get those either via email or our website, uh, uh, govcon.gnu.edu. But um, I wanna turn it over to Eric. Eric uh, Lofgren is our, fellow and he um, he's come over from um, another part of George Mason last year where he was doing a um, uh, doing a research on the history of defense acquisition uh, and he's also spent a lot of time in doing defense pricing where he was an analyst at uh, the at Cape and uh, he's written uh, this paper based uh, that you're going to see this video on it's very very thought-provoking and ambitious paper so I'll let uh, Eric turn over for the balance of the conversation so welcome everyone Great. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I wanted to say a few words here and then we'll show a quick video. And then the rest of the time we're, we're going to be focusing on this amazing panel that we have here. Um, so I just want to kind of frame the discussion here a little bit today. 
and talk about, again, acquisition reform. And many of you are familiar with the concept of, you know, this pendulum of acquisition reform that seems to have been going back and forth between, you know, control and oversight versus speed and innovation, right? And um, in the last few years, we've seen it been shifting towards that speed and innovation with, of course, military authorities, with delegation to the services, other transactions and CSOs, uh, a lot of innovation going on in cyber, right? And, and trying to bring in new entrants, software factories. There's a lot of things going on, but one of the worries is, you know, are we peaking and starting to recede back and going back on the pendulum towards the other direction? And, you know, one of the ways that we can think about this pendulum is, you know, having waterfall on one side and agile on the other. And when we try to give organizations more freedom to do agile type development processes, you know, are they able to exercise uh, those, those freedoms when you have waterfall processes that are institutionally surrounding the whole process? So a lot of times you will hear people talk about agile fall or water scrum fall, right? Where you have an agile process that's in the middle of larger institutional and business processes that are waterfall. And the question is, you know, will we be able to continue out pushing towards more reform or not? Because when we look back in history, right, for the past 50 years, there's, we've had plenty of uh, very thoughtful, intelligent leadership, much like Bill Perry in the 90s, right, David Packard in the 70s, even Frank Carlucci in the 80s, right, who have been trying to do rapid prototyping, competition, uh, delegation down to the services. And we, we seem to always be coming back in these pendulums back the other way. And so we have to think about, you know, when we're doing acquisition reform today, why did they fail in the past, right? And I would suggest, and, and one of the reasons of we're here talking today is that progress in adopting new technologies and new concepts of operations, I believe, you know, really needs to start tackling the, the budget process. And that's something that none of those reformers and Pentagon leadership in the past have really addressed. And so a lot of people say today that there's a little bit of a different feeling, right? It feels different today. There's a lot of new things going on. Maybe we're not gonna swing back on that pendulum, right? And one of the things that I think is actually pretty new and, and shows that is the innovation hubs, such as Defense Innovation Unit, AFWorks, Naval X. There's several of these uh, defense acquisition ecosystem uh, for the innovation hubs. And I think that's, that's a pretty good place. You know, they're getting a lot of attention in the media, in discussions. And I think that's a pretty good place to think about it because they're kind of like a bellwether, I think, for uh, the progress of acquisition reform. Because if they can really bring in new companies get, and new technologies and get some dynamism in the defense industry, well, that's a good reflection of the overall health of the acquisition system itself. And one of the primary problems, right, is what we call the quote unquote valley of death, you know, scaling the new technologies and getting them into a program of record. And one of the major issues there, of course, is the budget process or, you know, the planning, programming, budgeting, execution system, right, where you have this two year planning process. I can't even start anything new. Um, in less than two years, except for, you know, rare expedited uh, means, because I need the two years for programming to accommodate the one year for budgeting. And it takes a long time to line up the funding. And then once you get that, it's actually kind of locked in um, through the future years defense program for five or more years. And so that's one of the major contributors we will never solve the valley of death, of course, that's, that's a major problem that we even see in the commercial side of industry. Um, you're not solving the valley of death, but one of the big contributors to the problem that makes it even harder in the Department of Defense is that budget process. And we have to ask, you know, why does it take so long? Why is it so slow? And when we look at the budget process, it's not just a ceiling of money for organizations. You know, like I have an income and then that kind of translates into my budget, which I can allocate. Um, I, we're not providing organizations, you know, an, a certain amount of money to go after what they, a broad mission or to achieve a capability, a portfolio of capabilities. 
Rather, the budget identifies specific projects. So like $20 million to project X and $30 million to project Y and so on and so forth. And the issue with that is that you're creating a process that's very reliant on long range uh, prediction and control of future technologies, environmental um, spaces of, of combat, future threats, user preferences, and even the economy is something that has to be baked into those uh, projections of the future. Because when we do a new start, for the most part, it's not, you know, we're not controlling it in how much money do they need in the year of the budget. It's what's the life cycle cost. And it's a very, what you could call teletic versus incremental. It's, you know, looking at the life cycle of what the whole program will be over the future for many years, rather than an incremental decision process. And so when we think about, you know, the essential element of the PBB, the planning, programming, budgeting system, you know, what it really did when it was implemented by Robert McNamara in 1961 was change the classification of the budget from one focused on inputs to one focused on outputs, right? And this is kind of a philosophical point, but I think it has real implications for people on the ground in the system as they work it, right? And so in the past, before the PBBS, you had organic line items and appropriations for, for example, in the Army, you know, the, the Department of uh, Ordnance and the Signal Corps. And these were organizations that had a general mission that they could go accomplish, right? It did not control the activities, the programs, the objectives to be accomplished by those organizations. And in the Navy, of course, you have like the Bureau of Ships, the Bureau of Aeronautics, uh, Bureau of Navigation, and these guys had more flexibility within the year of execution to start something new that they didn't see coming from a couple of years before, but also to pivot, um, ramp down, uh, change direction, right? And then what we had with the PBBS when that started in 1961, was more reliance on a predictions of the future because now the budget controls what will be done and not just what is the cap of money provided to certain organizations, right? So when we're looking to kind of accomplish future technologies and or bring new technologies and new concepts of operations into the present, right? Um, there's kind of a general philosophical question that we can ask and it's, you know, should we start with the output in mind and then work our way back to how to get there? Or should we focus on the inputs, such as people, the training, enabling tools, infrastructure, and allow those, the culture and those processes to generate through the process of interaction, what those outputs will be. And I would suggest that a, a useful way of looking at this is actually, uh, you know, when you actually know a lot about causality and, Prediction is not so much of a problem because you know the relevant parameters of the problem and uh, there's not going to be a lot of uncertainty in the threats, in the technology readiness and the like. Then you actually do want to focus on the outputs and you want to do something that looks a little bit like an optimization problem, right? But then when you're actually in an environment of extreme uncertainty, I would argue that you, you want to focus on the inputs, right, and allow the outputs to, to result from that process. Uh, and so, of course, McNamara and his whiz kids, Charles Hitch, Alan Enthoven, David Novak, all these guys, right? When they're looking at defense weapon systems and the choices made on those, they really had the belief at that time that quantitative analyses could render uncertainty, you know, to, to make uncertainty less of an issue, that they could put their hands around the problem and they could more accurately predict what the next five, 10, 20 years will hold. Um, I would suggest that uh, in this age and the way that we've seen uh, commercial industry work, there's a lot of uncertainty in technology and everything else, right? And we have to move incrementally and that's kind of the foundations of Agile. And the PBBS is actually fragile to this constant change of information. And so uh, with that kind of introduction there, uh, I would like to just show you a quick video and then we'll introduce our panel and get their thoughts.
The Pentagon's budget is the master controller of virtually everything that happens in the Department of Defense, including how it buys aircraft, ships, launch vehicles, helicopters, and everything else. The Army budget justification document for fiscal year 21 is documented over 39 volumes, totaling a staggering 11,755 pages, and the Army represents just one quarter of the Pentagon's total request. Of the RDT&E program elements, 18% are under $5 million, and more than half of all program elements are under $29 million, and the mean program element is just $93 million. Compare that to the average venture capital fund, which allocates $207 million a year, and large VCs allocate more than $1 billion annually. It's not just the number of budget line items. In order for a lab or a firm to scale a new technology, it takes at least two years, and in many cases more, to get it programmed into the budget. This is called the Valley of Death, and that's assuming that over 50 offices approve it. Many defense offices have tried to bridge the Valley of Death, including the Defense Innovation Unit, Softworks, Naval X, and many others. However, without budget reform, their efforts may falter. The Valley of Death is just one issue. There are several other problems of equal importance that can't be fixed by tweaking the current system. Do you think China waits two or more years to find money for new military technologies? Their ability to move fast supports civil military fusion and has even resulted in their ability to access United States technology firms. In the 1950s and before, budgets were classified by organization, such as the Transportation Service, the Signal Service, the Medical and Hospital Department, and the Engineering Service. The question is, for research and development, should we return to congressional heritage of financial control? Here's what we're proposing for RDT&E. Today, the Army has 182 program elements that average just $69 million each. We're proposing something like 24 program elements averaging just over $500 million each. That's a reduction in PEs by a factor of 7.6, providing major organizations like the program executive offices and the laboratories the ability to exercise real portfolio management. The Navy, Air Force, and DOD-wide accounts can similarly be reorganized. Each major organization, usually led by a Senate-approved flag officer, will likely control between $250 million and perhaps $2 billion portfolios, allowing them to be agile and accelerate innovation. These portfolios are not extravagant. For example, in 1951, the Army Ordnance Service received an appropriation of $40 billion in today's dollars. The budgets will still maintain programmatic insight. The primary appropriations will remain the same. Within RDT&E, program executive offices will be the major unit of control. Underneath the organizations, major thrusts will outline programs, and below that, lower level insight. With greater flexibility, Congress requires new tools for transparency and accountability. This should include quarterly reports for funding movements, real-time dashboard insights, and more in-person reviews and classified briefings. In return, reprogramming and new start thresholds should be raised to 70 million or 20%. As Sean Barnes, an executive in the Air Force said, in today's information environment, there's no reason why we couldn't give Congress habitual, routine access to information. The point is a win-win proposition for both the Pentagon and the Congress. Please join us in making budget reform a reality. So with that video, I'd just like to remind everyone that the video and a lot of the, co and the comments I was making, those are not necessarily the views of George Mason, nor are they the views of the panelists, right? And those are the people we're gonna get the, the uh, input on today. Those were my personal views. And uh, 
so we have a great panel to kind of talk about these things. And I'd like to invite you guys to uh, add some questions in the Q&A function below, and we'll be able to get to your questions. And if you'd like to address them to specific uh, panelists, uh, please do so. We already have a question on board. Uh, but for now, I'd like to introduce the panelists and allow them to uh, make some observations. So I would like to start with uh, Katrina McFarland, who's hold, held a number of roles in today, and she's currently a commissioner on the National Security Commission on AI. She's a director for the Procurement Roundtable, and previously, as Jerry said, she served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. So Katrina, thanks for joining. Thank you, Eric. This is uh, a great discussion. It's actually fairly prevalent out there. And uh, I'm really just going to sort of tease people's minds before we get into the conversation because I think this will be a very rich one. I will offer that the system that we operate in is over five decades old that allows for us to do our acquisition. It's post uh, World War II founded. And inside of that, that was the environment that this system was built around. And the environment has changed. Uh, I will just use a couple things that I found of interest from the draft NDAA languages, both from the SASC and the HASC, and one of which was collection of data. We have a, an ability now to inform ourselves much better than we've been able to in the past if we start leveraging it. And I think that the tensions between the systems as they're currently designed were, are built around the fact that we've had tons of people attempt to change the system without letting it mature and give us a full unveiling of what it, did that mean. Um, so I think the opportunity space is there to take and gather information and start running pilots and measuring success to make change. Um, I think especially given where we're going in the digital world, where we need to be able to make better informed qu decisions quicker. And so I'm looking forward to seeing a change I'm looking forward to understanding how we could change the system and allow for that three arms or three branches of the government to have their ability to perform what their administration or their charter is and make uh, balanced decisions. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Katrina. Short and sweet. <laughs> so next up is uh, Bill Greenwald. And he's a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And previously, he was the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Industrial Policy. And he served also as a professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And there he helped formulate some of the recent authorities like middle tier. So Bill Greenwald, over to you. No, no, uh, th thank you, Eric. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for this really provocative paper and I think timely uh, paper. And I'd urge everybody in the audience to, to read it, but also to go back into your uh, sources, because I think it's so important to start looking at the sources for this system. In other words, going back to the whiz kids and going back to the RAD reports of the 50s and 60s, because we created a paradigm, a way of thinking, a way of management that started off in the late 50s and early 60s that we still live with, as you say in your report. And the world, as Katrina says, has, has massively changed. And, and we, we need to kind of you know, look at why and the reasons for that. And I, and I think that's, that's the, the, the next thing that, uh, you know, the, in, this, in this discussion is to go and look at the reasons why. Why haven't we reformed? And I think the first thing to, st to start off is, is to say, why do we even have the system? Well, it was the best practice the best thinking, the best management thinking of the 1950s. When McNamara brought this system in, it was you know, the guiding principles of Ford Motor. Now, we probably should have thought about that after the auto industry went into, into the, uh, the tank you know, 15 years later, but it was the best practice and we brought that in and it grew out of this whole concept of scientific management and, and frankly, a fear of the Soviet Union. This was post Sputnik. And you know, the five-year plans and centralized planning were, were essentially what was gonna take over the world. And Americans were scared at that time. And this was the way of getting some control. And so 
the system was created and, 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 and moved forward. Now, why haven't we decided, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Why, why do we have a Soviet style system that's running the Department of Defense for 60 years? Well, probably two reasons. The first is power. The first is this system encouraged and, 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 and put the services and the OSD relationship into a different framework. And I think we have to kind of understand that and that's gonna be something that's gonna be hard to change. And then the second thing was this system gave the, really the, the keys to the kingdom to the uh, House and Senate Appropriations Committees to essentially do what they've always wanted to do, which is to have control and, and be, have the ability to, to uh, influence uh, where this money is going to be spent. And that system, those power structures are still in, in place today and would need to be addressed. But one more thing that is probably has been no compelling case for change is this system was the system that won the Cold War. Okay, we won the Cold War with the system, with the acquisition system, with all the other things. So why do we need to, in the bureaucracy, change it? Well, I think the, the, the focus is, you know, we won the system despite the processes and management procedures we had because we had when we competed against the Soviets, they had two centralized planning systems, one for their defense and one for the economy. And they were both pretty much the same. Ours were entirely different. And we won because of that. We need to kind of understand that and start making the, the, the various changes. So I think when we, when we look at this, you know, we need to kind of look at that history, try to figure out what the, what the assumptions and, and rationale for us, what are the barriers to change, and then come up with new criteria for success. And I think your idea on, on you know, looking at inputs and outputs is, is hugely important. I think the criteria we should start looking at is time. Time was something that we did differently in World War II and the immediate 50s. Time did not become relevant or became a value anymore. Value, again, the value of, 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 of actually outcomes kind of was thrown out of, out of, out of the system for, for 60 years. Those are the type of criteria that needs to come back. So with that, I will let um, my next colleague, uh, Mr. Daigle, think some provocative thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Bill. That was great. Uh, just like to introduce Bob here real quick. Bob Daigle, he's the Director for Strategy at Rebellion Defense, which is a technology startup. And in his previous role, he was the Director of the Pentagon's Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation Office. So that's actually charged with overseeing the programming aspects of the budget process so Bob Daigle is a real expert here. And before that, he was also a professional staff member on the House Armed Services Committee and held many other uh, roles as well. So Bob, take it over. Um, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. This is gonna be a, a fun, fun conversation, I hope. Um, I wanna pick up on something that Bill just said because it's right in line with, with what I was thinking. Uh, and it has to do with time. Um, and I'm probably not allowed to say this as a former director of CAPE, but, uh, you know, uh, I will anyway. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we live in a world where none of us can know what tomorrow holds. Um, you know, we are living in really interesting times right now, but even before that, when Bill and Katrina and I were working together through thinking about acquisition reform, um, I have no idea what technology is going to be in two years. I would challenge anybody to, uh, to suggest that they know with any amount of certainty uh, what innovation is going to come out of Silicon Valley or out of Austin or out of Texas. Uh, and I think to your point, Eric, and to the point of this paper and the point of this discussion today, um, trying to project the future with certainty, either through a requirements process or through a budget process. Uh, is does more harm than good these days. Um, we restrict today uh, the choices of tomorrow based on our current understanding without a recognition that that understanding is probably wrong. Um, and, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, I, would, I would suggest to Eric as, as I did in our, our precursor to this, uh, to this conversation, that that central thought needs to go beyond the budget process. We need to take a really hard look at the requirements process. We need to look at, um, at 
to Bill's point, the way Congress does its work and the amount of uh, the amount of work that is done today to both perfectly specify what a requirement is going to be five years from now, what a budget should be five years from now, and then lock that in so that it's hard to change tomorrow is a very big problem. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan, Eric, of you know your, your central thesis of budgeting at higher levels of specificity, um, or I guess lower levels of specificity, larger, larger pots of money without as much detail around it. Uh, I think that's true for the services, and I think the oversight layers of OSD and the joint staff um, and, and congressional oversight uh, would be better served getting the outcomes that they really want, which is faster adoption of innovation by taking some of the controls in the current system away. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. One of the things that it seems from reading some of the history was that, you know, when I look at the defense acquisition system and that chart that everyone sees the defense acquisition guide where you have these three rungs that are co-equal, you have the requirements, JSTS process, the little a acquisition process, and then the PBBE. When, you know, when I was look, reading the history, that wasn't true. There was one uh, that was above the rest. The system was the PBBS and its twin concept of uh, systems analysis. And through that structure, you actually had requirements as kind of like ancillary, but something that fed in to those analyses to define the parameters required. And so the requirements, the requirements pull process as opposed to the technology push, I see it as kind of a consequence and a necessary input to the functioning of the PBB system. Did you have anything to say on that, Bob? Yeah, I don't know if it has to work that way. Um, you know, during my time at Cape, if we take the Space Development Agency, for example, um, just one tactical example, uh, we know that we need new space sensors, and we know that those space sensors need to be driven to uh, lower power requirements and smaller form factors. Um, where we settled on in terms of funding was to create a PE that provided broad discretion with regard to how are we going to pursue sensor technology in space uh, and then allocated a certain amount of money to it. So if you think about it, if, if you think about that as a small portfolio, um, I think portfolio management within the current budget process, current PPBS process, is a completely legitimate outcome. Uh, if you think about a portfolio as, you know, just a larger collection of money uh, without as much specificity, um, that's completely consistent with the PPBS process. I do think at the end of the day, you're going to have, I, I don't think you can get the genie so far back inside the bottle that Washington isn't going to ask, uh, hey, what are the outputs that I'm getting for this amount of money? I, I, you know, uh, and I think that those questions are going to have to be answered. The question is, at what level of specific specificity do they need to be answered? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And, and we see these uh, program elements that engender uh, portfolio-based management, I think, throughout the department to some degree. We have JIDO, uh, the Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Organization, uh, the Space Development Agency, as you said, the Joint Artificial Intelligence uh, Center is also kind of structured as its own uh, program element, and Strategic Capabilities Office is another one. So we see these interspersed throughout, um, but it's not necessarily the, the general way about going about uh, defense budgeting. And I think to the degree that we have more of that, I think the PBBS, um, a lot of the structure, yes, it makes sense, but you know, the PBBS is an instantiation of the program budget. And now it's like, well, are we focusing on programs or capability area portfolios or dr mission driven organizations, right? So is it really a PBBS process um, or not, uh, I'd like to get some of your uh, insights there. I'm going to turn it over to Katrina because she has something to say. 
So you're hitting upon something that as an acquisition person has always troubled me. If we're really trying to meet the national defense strategy, we would be focused on outcomes, that is effect-based outcomes. What and do we need to achieve in order to achieve overmatch and meet our mission objectives? Instead, we've traced or followed the money. And let me give you a classic example of that. So in the army, uh, we've come to the conclusion that we have to change in what we have for combat vehicles. And we decided based on the totality of available funding that we would no longer want to procure tanks because necessarily tanks aren't that highest of a priority. However, that was overturned because of the equities. And another area is if you're really focused on national security in terms of priority, some of the lower cost items actually have a huge contribution to the effectivity of a service. Let's call out command and control. And you see with the peer threat that we have right now, there's a huge impetus to solve this whole joint air defense command and control problem. But that's because it's languished. It's not a high budget visibility item because the budget had become and has become over time more focused on, as you talked in your um, presentation, the spend. What we should be thinking about is the attributes of capability and how does that translate into meeting the national defense strategy. And I think if we did that, we'd find more of these little pop-ups and more of these trade spaces where we know we have to have the equities and the visibility into the larger spend, but we would pay attention and husband through things like enabling technologies, command and control, the lesser spend, but yet more important in terms of the actual effectivity and effect, you know, efficacy of our capability sets. Just thinking out loud. Anything to add there, Bill? Yeah, yeah. And, and the last thing I want to do is sit here and try to do incremental reform over PPBE instead of blowing it up. But this actually, when, when you go back to the original intent, as far as I can tell, there was the desire to do greater cost accounting, cost analysis, to drive the system into performance budgeting and performance based on outcomes. That never happened. And, and if you look at, and I think this is really critical to look at how we do accounting, which is really kind of boring, but you know, I think this is significant. You know, our accounting is to address outputs. In other words, where did the money go? Just as Katrina was saying, that's our financial system. And then Congress tried to, to drive a financial system to add up what are our assets and liabilities? And we'll do the CFO Act, which is almost, you know, more than worthless because we're spending a lot of money to get any, nothing that we can do, we can manage the department in. The thing we didn't do was cost analysis and cost accounting. And we started to get there with, with uh, uh, the, the private sector, but Rick over pushed this to let's use cost analysis to drive down profit margins and not essentially drive getting the data throughout the department, not just for, from, from, the, from the primes, to manage to better outcomes. Thanks, Bill. I think that's a really important point. And the Rickover uh, hearings back in the 60s where he's trying to get the cost accounting standards uh, implemented, just hilarious and really insightful. I would recommend people read some of those. Um, but I think this also goes back to what Bob was talking about in terms of, well, what are you justifying? What are those outcomes? And how do you, um, you know, show to the higher levels that are, have a real uh, job to do in terms of oversight? How do you bring them in on the process and have them be comfortable? And Brittany Clayton here has a nice question about this, where she's saying basically the president budget, the president's budget documents you know, they have all this historical cost and programmatic data, and these go back, um, you know, quite a ways. And so she asks, in the proposing framework with far fewer program elements, would a similar level of detailed cost reporting be required? If not, do we risk losing the transparency of that cost data? And real quick, uh, before I turn it over to you, you know, one of my thoughts it, here is that when we look to how um, the structure was in the 50s, 40s, and before, right? Uh, you didn't tie the programmatic aspect to the budget necessarily, but there was always in the comptroller shop, you know, a program analysis shop, which eventually became 
you know, the Office of, Sec of Systems Analysis and then grew into CAPE. But what this, what this shop used to do was actually do just that, what Bill was kind of talking about and what's being asked here, collect cost data on what actually happened. Where did the money go? What did we get for it? And then tie that in with effectiveness. So instead of being a forward looking plan based on predictions, right? Um, so we're, instead of justifying these budgets to specific end items based on predictions of performance and costs, you're actually collecting the real costs in real time and showing what actually did happen for that and provide that kind of um, ecosystem of information that can inform decisions, not necessarily through the budget, but you still had managers and oversight agencies able to focus on what did I get and what, what are the plans going forward. And so through those appropriations hearings, you heard a lot about what, what the services wanted to do. It's, not, it's just that you didn't have uh, very detailed line items that tethered you to those plans defined a couple of years before. So anyone who want to jump in there and, and talk about, you know, where is the detailed cost report? Should we still have detailed cost reporting, right? And where's the transparency coming from? I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I, I think, you know, if that is, I think, the goal of the oversight community would like to have. And I think the management would like to have the ability to, to, to have the types of information that they can make better decisions on. My concern is I'm not certain whether the U.S. government has the, um, uh, the, done the work to identify what the best practices are in that area. And I, and I think you know, that we, we should be looking at not just private, but public sector, foreign, uh, state and local governments, who can actually do the best job of what are, what are the best practices in cost accounting, managerial cost accounting, uh, and, and could those be brought in to the federal government to allow decision makers to make better decisions based on what we're spending? And, and, and I think that is, that's a financial accounting discussion that we just never had because again, we, we have two systems. What are we spending on? And you know, let's go count uh, you know, bullets and, uh, and uh, blankets and figure out what, 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 our, what our assets and liabilities are. Katrina, did you want to jump in? So I have a parochial view in this regard. I believe that at certain points in the system of acquisition, there's more fidelity associated or knowledge associated with the cost. And I believe at the beginning, it's obviously very nebulous. And as you graduate towards fielding, it's much more detailed. And I think we have right now in our grasp if we could adopt it, systems that could help us have visibility into that information and not make it a reporting ritual where human frailties come into play with errors. Um, I think that we could graduate even within the system as it's currently constructed to be far more effective in this regard. Um, I'll hesitate to state that cost account standards uh, should be totally revamped, but I'll offer to you as a nation, we have many cost account standards that we impose upon our population, whether it's industry people or government. And each of them seem to have seemingly reasons for having narrowly defined areas. So I'll take the IRS and I'll take our, our preferred use of cost account standings for programs. And so when I'm an industry partner, I have to report two different methodologies. And I don't quite understand that in today's environment, why I could not find one standard to apply for all of us. So I defer to those that are financial wizards. Um, but going back to the premise of this discussion, which is, where is today? I think that we could indeed accelerate the application of the science, and I'm very heartened to see what the Authorization Act drafts look like because there's an implication on AI and I totally, totally am um, supportive of advancing our methodology. Bob? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just a huge fan of data. So my default position is collect it all. 
um, collect everything. What you do with it afterwards, I don't know. Somebody smarter than me is going to come along sometime after me and crawl through all this data and you know realize that the meaning of life is 42 or whatever. Um, but but this is a fight that I had uh, the last couple of years inside the Pentagon, where uh, you know there was a there was a preference for um, well, since you know Bill Greenwald devolved all acquisition authority down to the services, the services don't have to report any data on acquisition costs or results um, into a central system. And you know, we just kind of drew the line and said that's absolutely not correct. Um, you know, we're going to need this data going forward for analysis, um, and centralization of data is should be one of the key. Uh, um, lines of effort inside the Department of Defense. You know, we've had, uh, I, since being on the private sector, we've had um, working with a number of uh, companies on the outside and, and Netflix and folks like that. And, and we've spoken about how they think about data. And the idea that there is ownership of data and your organization owns this data and my organization owns this data uh, is a foreign concept to most, you know, major uh, data um, companies in America, uh, collect it all, storage is cheap, guaranteed we'll figure out a use for it tomorrow. Yeah, I, I hear you. I was, uh, when I was uh, a consultant in the Cape, I, my, my project was the cost assessment data enterprise. So shout out to, to the Cade folks. And we, it's, it's, it's really a rabbit hole, this cost accounting, um, you know, discussion on because every OEM kind of has their own different system, and then how far, how deep do you go? And you know, we'll have conversations with some where they just kind of have a couple, you know, cost account codes, and others where they're going down to like like tens of thousands of, of work packages. And to Katrina's point, most of the nuisance that comes out of industry is less about the transmission of data because my system can talk to your system, and we can just transfer information automatically. It has to do with the bespoke formats in which the government requests data that requires manual manipulation or spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet to transform the same data multiple ways to provide it to multiple offices. Um, you know, we should be past that. But I think what's really important, though, is how you use the data and when. And most importantly, if there's a time constraint. In other words, when we were collecting data in World War II and operations research was, was, was the thing, it was a time sensitive, let's do analysis. And then, yeah, there's, we can keep doing the data for later analysis you know, beyond. And the problem I think we have now is we collect data to collect data, and then we wait and, 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 and let the process become three or four years before we can make a decision. And, and, and that, that's what's driving this, this long-term budget process this kind of paralysis by analysis. If you're gonna if you're gonna get the data, you know, and you 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 need to use it, but you also be, have to be time limited and don't affect and Im negatively impact things that are moving uh, down the road that we need to go fast on. So I have to absolutely support what Bill just was talking about. In particular areas, and I'm not referring obviously to the building out of a ship, but rather to uh, IT, the system is not agile. It's not adaptable as it's currently defined. And we try to parse it out and make it fit into this cost and to this programming and budgeting world. And if anything in this environment needs to be adjusted quickly, given the threat of what's going on in the world today, we should closely look at this type of a system to see if there's other agile budgetary methods that could be used that still provide adequate visibility in given where we are today, because we're falling behind rapidly. So I have a question here from Jamie Sokoc. Um, he's basically asking, you know, he's saying, you know, the engineering and program management functions seem to be employing, you know, Agile pretty fully. And so his question is really, you know, how can we posture for Agile you know, from the financial management perspective. And, you know, do you guys actually feel that it's more difficult to implement Agile 
in this functional area of financial management. Who wants to jump on that grenade? <laughs> you spoke first, Katrina. <laughs> uh, so I believe that we have a challenge, that we have to find a way to work with Congress, OMB, and all the branches of government in this area. And that is not overnight. It is not agile by design. It can be made agile. I've seen excursions. The Defense Acquisition Workforce Initiative, for example. We have a huge amount of cleanup at the end of the year that we just don't get expended and it goes back into Treasury and Congress felt very strongly that the workforce needed to be improved. So they gave us flexibility in utilizing expired funds to apply that to the workforce. Over time, the comptroller who hated something out of family basically killed that and went to appropriated. So we have people who, if you look at it, the system can adjust. It's just very, very, um, hmm. if I was to use material analysis, the RC would be in excess of 90, which is very, very, very brittle. So you don't seem to have the ability to be flexible in this. And we need to start thinking about that because, and I believe with the use of data will help people understand it. It is okay to have differences inside of the system. I, I, I agree with Katrina 100%. I, I, I think there is such a, um, I don't think we're, we're fearful enough. And, and the, the threat has to drive this. And, and, and we are falling behind. And yes, there are pockets of uh, agility now in engineering. And yes, there's pockets of agility now in contracting. And, and, but it's not the whole system. And from the budget standpoint, we still have people, again, who still believe that this system is going to make it and, and don't understand that they are now part of the problem. And they're in comptroller, they're in the, in the, in the Congress. And we all have to kind of get together and say, who's the enemy here? And what do we need to do to actually uh, uh, be competitive again? We're, we're not ahead anymore. We are, we, are, we are falling behind if we've not already fallen behind. And that requires drastic changes. And, and budgeting and finance is definitely an area, it's, it's, it's not really sexy, but that's gonna be one of those things that's gonna, gonna uh, potentially recreate our competitiveness in the future. Bill, I was going to congratulate you as not including CAPE uh, as part of the problems. You said Congress and Comptroller, uh, but then you said that uh, budgeting and programming isn't sexy, so I, I have to take your compliment away. Um, it, you know, just a thought for, you know, Bill and I worked really well together when we were on the Hill doing a lot of the acquisition reform stuff. Um, one of the conversations that we had uh, often um, that is useful for this conversation as well is um, don't necessarily try to fix the current system. It's too hard. Everywhere you look in the current system, there is a stakeholder and that stakeholder is going to defend their turf. Um, it is often better to just create new pathways through which activity can run um, outside of the current system. So, you know, Eric, you mentioned early on, hey, the middle tier of acquisition or OTAs or, um, or some of those activities. Um, I think the same is true as it relates to uh, budgeting. And when we start thinking about AI, when we start thinking about IT programs, when we start thinking about Agile, um, I would suggest to the system, you know, I think, um, I think Secretary Lord receives a lot of credit for going after colorless money for uh, software acquisition. I think she should go further than that and start thinking about different acquisition processes for, um, for software and things like that. There's an opportunity when you're working in a kind of clean slate environment like that, when you're, when you're just pulling up a blank piece of paper and saying, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's create a whole new thing from a blank piece of paper there's no existing stakeholders, so there's no existing stakeholders to defend the status quo. Um, it might be a way forward in areas like this. But I, I agree 100% pathways are, are, are a way to go. 
and we do have acquisition pathways now. We have pathways around the requirements process. The problem we've had, and, and Katrina was right on target there, things like the DOTF, which were a, a, a pathway to actually get the acquisition workforce up to snuff to be able to use these authorities was killed by the budget people. It was killed by, let's go back to the Soviet process and control money the way we've always controlled it. And, and that to me is, you know, budget pathways are gonna be so much harder. And now we've done it in the past, I agree. You know, we've, you know, if you can, all, you can probably argue that OCO was one and counter ID was one and, and, and a few others that we've done for missile defense in the past and so on. But we, we need, uh, you know, an, an, an several other different pathways in budget, and they're just going to be so hard to get because the antibodies not just are in Congress, but they're in the department themselves. And, and that's where I think we have to start. So, so just think of that huge ecosystem that you're talking about. The ecosystem involves our ERP, all of our data systems that we've invested so much money in, which then ties us to industry because they support and work within our system as it's currently defined. On top of that, we have process. You've been talking about it and I'm really thrilled to hear that because a lot of people can, you know, confuse uh, process with practice. If we were to clean slate a system and really look at just what it takes to go build something and field it, if you would, that is anything from the requirements down to getting it in the hands of the user, you would not see some of the oddities that we have that we're dealing with, right? So in, in terms of, let's just pull software to the front. In terms of software, the way the, the process is involved is a lot of people who haven't actually, and aren't actually ownership of the responsibility or the outcome being involved in ensuring equities are met somehow within the design of that act. So have, has, in terms of things that we could do that don't involve Congress, they involve ourselves, we should be looking at the process and not the practice, but use the practice to help us define a better process. How many people really need to be there? Can we use automation to confirm or deny that the issues have been met like CMMC or, or cyber protection or uh, fill in the blank, live fire test and evaluation. You could do it in any domain. But we should be thinking about how can we remove the burden that it, that, and the cost that candidly comes from that timeout that you take in order to get the next approval step forward. And I'll give you a classic example of this. The Army had been very, very frustrated under Heidi Shu about the timelines it took to the, for them to get to yes. You know, I think Heidi had said it's like being on a school bus and everybody in all of the seats of the school bus was trying to drive it for you, even though you had the steering wheel. So if you take a look at all of those entities that become part of your ecosystem, the time that it takes to brief them, answer their questions, and brief everyone to get to the point where you can have a yes, takes years out of your program timeline. And that cost is burdened in there. Now, take that to the budgetary system. Have you watched it? My favorite chart is how many lines are on that chart that says where you are in the budgetary process. You're developing, you're executing, you're reviewing. Oh my God, right? Think of the manpower that's involved in that. So let's pull the process out, put it over here and take what it, Take a really look at the fundamentals. What does it take to do the financial process real? You might find your process has hindered your progress with your practice. Just saying. I would love to jump on that because A, I completely agree with you. And it goes back to one of the points I raised earlier. You started that conversation of what does it take to get a capability into a user's hand? So that means you have to start the process at the beginning of that, um, at, at the beginning of that thought, which is often in the service requirement systems. And to me, we can, Eric, to your point about your paper, I'm a huge fan of pulling the budget process up a couple of layers 
um, to doing capability-based um, budgeting and offering the same kind of freedoms in that world that we did in, um, in parts of the acquisition world. But I'm a huge fan of just burning the entire requirements process to the ground. Uh, I don't see, and I have not seen for years, where it adds a lot of value into the process of what actually gets into the hands of, of the users. Yeah, I, I tend to agree when I look at the requirements process. It's not that we don't need requirements. Of course, we need an interaction between requirements and then technical feasibility that's going on in, in this manner. But just having this monolithic structure up front and then you get all and, and Rick over, of course, he, he talks about this a lot, the layering of bureaucracy kind of to what Katrina was talking about. It's not just that it takes a lot of time to get people um, and their approval. And Rick had this great story of a guy who was trying to get signatures from these people around the Pentagon. And then by the time he made his round, uh, the individuals had left their office and he was just too distraught to even go back out and start the process again for several months. So, um, but it's not just the time of, of getting the approvals. It's, and it's not just the gold plating where everyone has their own little thing that they want to throw on. And it's not any one thing, but it's, you know, that marginal next thing that breaks the camel's back. It's also that, and George Scherer said this, who was the, what, the chief designer of the B-52 for Boeing and one of their former executives, he said, you couldn't get 10 reasonably knowledgeable people into a room and look at technologies like nuclear power, the radar, the jet engine, before they were created and have them agree on that that is a feasible um, and good thing to pursue. So when I look at um, the requirements process and then how it feeds into what actually gets funded through the budget and you can't you know, execute on the next new technology unless you get those approvals, um, it seems that there's, uh, you know, that's where some of that layering of bureaucracy, the non-consensual things are often the things that are most likely to prove revolutionary. Bob? And from an academic perspective, from a, from a data management measurement perspective, uh, Careful when you start trying to measure decision making time, because I've, you know, we've had this conversation with the joint staff for years around JSONs, and you know, they will rightfully point out that hey, the amount of JSONs time has declined precipitously over the last few years because of some reforms they've done internally. Uh, and we pulled the amount of time that paper is sitting in the joint staff inbox down from something like 240 days to 70 days. And that's, that's great. Then when you talk to the services, they'll say, yeah, but that's only because they pushed all of that work to us. And we have, we're spending all of that Delta and more because they've jacked up the requirements for what is necessary to hit the, the send button to the joint staff. So when you look at this, you need to look at it end to end and figure out what's really going on. Where are people spending their time? And, and to your point, is that time adding value to the, the provision of capabilities to the warfighter? Yeah, I love, uh, oh, someone told me once that, you know, like, hey, metrics are great. We love metrics. They're, they're, they're actually very important. But you need to have kind of like a group of metrics and anytime that you kind of take one thing or a couple of things and then, you know, incentivize all performance and outcomes based on those metrics, then it becomes a bad metric. So it's almost like when you formalize a metric like speed to do this, well, they're going to just figure out ways, you know, to do things on the periphery or that are outside that you didn't intend, but then turn that metric into something bad. Yep, that's called a perverse incentive. Great. So we have a bunch of questions here, and I want to get to some of them. A couple of them, uh, one from Douglas Ber Berenson and an anonymous person, they're kind of talking about, you know, well, I would say that there's two kind of questions here, right? So, you know, first is, is this consolidation and this reform of the, the budget process an ideal thing, something that we want to work for in the abstract, right? And then there's the question of, well, if it's good, right? 
what are the realistic ways to get there, right? And, and we talked a little bit about carving out some, some new areas and letting those on the side kind of grow in a different way. But, but the questions here are really, you know, does Congress have a desire to move to a different system? Do they even want a change in that system? And then, you know, one of the other questions here is, you know, does the election in this upcoming year affect the likelihood of it getting any kind of uh, budget reform? So Bill, did you want to take that on? Sure, and I, and I think, you know, and, and Bob, you, you, know, you, you, you were there as well, so please pile on. I think Congress and the members and the staff, you really want to try to do the right thing, okay? And so, yeah, we have the system that they're stuck in. They love it because it you know, allows them to earmark better or at least to follow their earmarks because there are no earmarks, but there are earmarks. And, but, but the reality is, is that this has to come from the department and, and it has to come from uh, the, the, the budget shop in a way that explains to the appropriators that this is, this, this is, this is in our national security interest. And I truly believe, based on all the you know, time I've been up there, that, that the Congress will eventually go there. But right now, they don't have any reason to. There, there's, there's no need to change. The department isn't really complaining. People in the department are complaining. But the people they deal with are the, are the comptroller. And the comptroller loves the system and loves all the... Uh, the ways of, of controlling the services or try, and doing all this, this uh, 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 process. And so this has, to be, this has to come internally first and then try to sell it to, to, to Congress. Now, you know, there, there will be some uh, uh, pushback. Uh, there's going to be need for greater uh, uh, transparency when, when in, in exchange. But it, ultimately, I think you, you, there is the possibility to achieve reform here. And I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I would normally be in, uh, in many reforms. Bob? Well, Bill, I was gonna sort of react, uh, this is Jerry, I was gonna ask you a bit about this. I mean, because I mean, a lot of these ideas, portfolio management have been around for a while. I mean, the, the 809 panel certainly shed a lot of blood or a lot of ink on it, the, the idea. So but what you're arguing is really that we just really need to come up with, the department needs to come up with a, a better idea on how to do that and that, that there would be willing, um, that the appropriators and the others on the Hill would be willing to accept that kind of approach. I think you're willing to have, start having a discussion. And, and, but frankly, what we do is we have these little marginal discussions. I want this little pot here, and then we, we immediately go down to, well, I'm not sure if there's enough transparency, and, and do you really need that pot? Do you really know what you're doing? And, and back and forth. I think the, the department needs to come up with comprehensive 1961 reform and say, you know, the Chinese are, are going to uh, win this conflict if we don't get our act together. And we need to work with you, Congress, to uh, bring this forward. And, and frankly, I don't think the appropriators or Congress want to be the, um, to have the blame for the fact that we will not be able to compete with our uh, great power competitors because they sit there and want to earmark something in the state of X. Uh, I, I, I think, I think there, you know, the department is not giving itself enough credit because I do think that there are people in the department who like this system and do not want to give it up. And they blame the appropriators. And of course, the appropriators are going to say, well, I don't need to do anything because I, you know, the department doesn't know what, it's, what it wants. So I'd like to add a little color to this. And, and I would offer to you that it relates to what your underlying thesis is, which is the threat. Um, the amount of visibility by Joe Public onto the threat has really been diluted by all the other activities that are going on with COVID, you name it, uh, upcoming election. The, the visibility into how right now the heightened environment it, it is just remarkable. If you were just to extract the few um, issues that are in the open press about what's going on in the world today and have those other distractors removed, 
you would find public would be very interested, I believe, in trying to find out how to change the dynamic in terms of where our position in the world is relative to our ability to execute um, the national defense strategy or our means to preserve our um, country's values, morals, et cetera. And I find that a bit disturbing. I think Congress, at least I know the staff is aware and are definitely trying to make the adjustments as best as they can, but they're somewhat strapped by the traditional exchange that occurs between uh, OSD and themselves and the services and trying to develop something that they can institute that their members would be able to focus on. And so I think this type of a dialogue with some meaningful uh, attributes tied to data would definitely help them make changes. Can they make an overnight change? I'll be the possibly the only pessimist with a half glass. I don't think you could do it overnight unless we had a significant emotional event. But I do trust in the nature of our society and our people that if we had a significant emotional event, we'd move very quickly. The real question is, is it too late? So we do need to make these incremental changes and we need to make them informed so the members can um, still retain their needs and have their issues met because they obviously it's all a balance issue that industry can adjust and that of course the other two branches legislative and executive have the ability to um, manage and uh, retain their abilities to uh, oversee and execute their um, platform so I, I think that there is barring having a civics class here I think there are things that we can do within the structure of the government to make change. And perhaps it's um, lesser than the perfect, it might be a grand compromise, but I think we've had a conversation here that talked about elements of change where we focus in on something that's different, that we focus in on use to leave data to remove people from the equation. I mean, we can go through all the little pieces, commodity, focus on national defense strategy, not just on the top of the spend, and we can improve the outcomes of the system. Um, I guess I'll leave it right there. Let me add one thing, because there's one part of, of this that we're not focusing on that Congress listens to a lot. And that's what I'm going to call the oversight industrial complex. In other words, GAO, DODIG, the audit agencies, the various stovepipes they've created to essentially be the checkers of the system to ensure compliance with the oversight and transparency process that's been created over the last 60 years. This complex needs to come to a realization. And I think that has to come with this, uh, a focus by senior management working with them that they are now a part of the problem. The criteria that they are using is not the criteria that's going to get us to deliver a capability faster to counter the Chinese or the Russians. They, you know, and, and, and criteria is everything to them. We have to understand what we're evaluating. And time, again, has to be, and outcomes have to be a greater criteria that the oversight complex measures to versus just compliance with process. Because that's what the appropriators are gonna hear and that's what the authorizers are gonna hear, that DOD is not complying. Therefore, we better not give them any more flexibility. Katrina, I'm gonna be far more pessimistic than you were. Um, I think that there are pockets and areas generally new pockets in which a clean sheet approach might work. So if we think uh, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Agents Center or um, SCO or things like that. Um, my experience over the last few years is that there are a few very thoughtful members and some of the staff on the Hill that is interested in systemic reform uh, in order to make the process move more quickly so that we can get uh, innovation across the valley of death and into the hands of the warfighters more quickly. Where I've seen that 
uh, general uh, direction fail over and over again is on the eaches. And, and a couple of examples. I will argue that there is the only thing more important from a capability development standpoint in the Department of Defense, other than nuclear modernization, is the Jedi cloud contract. Um, the adoption of centralized cloud-based technology uh, unlocks so much potential inside DoD and, and creates a pathway to start to change uh, how DoD manages data, it creates a platform for artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, <laughs> if nothing else, it starts to create a pathway by which uh, DoD can create a set of standards on which platforms should be built um, to allow for better data transfer, better communications, better cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on and on and on. Uh, the history of JEDI has been a nightmare so far. Um, a capability that is uh, widely accepted as being transformational in the broader society um, became, to Bill's point, a political football inside the government. Uh, we attempted to put, another example is we attempted to put, uh, you know, Bill, you and I talk all the time about acquisition speed and, and we need to be able to take risk. And uh, everyone around us was saying, yes, fail fast, fail often, uh, try it, uh, it's all good. Um, except when it comes to unmanned uh, naval vessels. And hey, we're gonna put a lot of money against this and we're gonna try it and, um, and we're gonna fail fast and we're gonna fail often. Nope, go through the traditional acquisition system, slow down, uh, you know, do one prototype this year, do another prototype seven years from now, 15 years from now, we might know whether or not this capability works. Uh, and I think that that's where I'm more pessimistic is there's a, there's a theory of reform, but then on both sides of Washington, there is a, the, the crushing oversight of the eaches. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I agree. Uh, did you want that. to jump in there, Bill? No, no, no. Go, go ahead. I mean, I, mean, I just, I just, I just agree with that. It's just so uh, the the problem that that you're going to see here is some of these things are be, because of not the oversight industrial complex, but the military industrial complex that you know the, the the lobbying for some of these things to 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 keep these things from happening are great, and how you can counter that. The only thing I I can really see that is frankly, if perhaps maybe some of our allies pick up the con and actually go off and, and have unmanned uh, uh, systems that are 20 times better than us and, and shame us, uh, you know, in, into actually doing the right thing. But, you know, that may be the only alternative there. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Bill. You know, this is a great discussion. We have, you know, a bunch of open questions here from the audience. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, but maybe we'll be able to, you know, answer some of these and put them, post them up later. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get to, to one question here from Steven Rodriguez. And if we have time, I want to talk a little bit about uh, budget activity eight for software systems, which is just a big, you know, it's a big issue here. But going back to Steven Rodriguez's uh, question, he basically says that, you know, nation states have struggled managing that necessary change from legacy systems and processes um, in order to create new systems. Uh, and then he kind of points to the Wehrmacht and the PLA as kind of being uh, successful because they were able to more or less, you know, start from a blank slate. And I would almost, um, you know, add the interwar Navy in there where they had, you know, major uh, reductions in capital shipbuilding, which allowed them to kind of experiment through the general board and that pluralistic organization to move into carriers where you'd expect them not to. And so... You know, I would just like for you guys to, to comment on the budget process in this interaction, because it seems like for me that the PBBS is one of these institutions that's kind of, you know, locking in some of these legacy programs and it's making it really hard to, to shift away from those things and find a new little wedge, you know, just to go do something new. And it often, you know, as Bob was saying, it, it can take a, a long time just to kind of 
get spun up on something new. Whereas, you know, it felt like in the 40s and 50s, we're able to pounce on new things relatively quickly, right? Like, you know, Rick Rover was able to build the very first uh, working reactor for atomic power in five, less than five years and integrate it on the submarine in that five year time span, right? So, so can you guys just, um, you know, comment about the budget process and then how that, how that uh, interacts with shifting away from legacy systems and adopting new things? Well, I, I'll, I'll just say that mid-tier Section 804 was designed based on two periods of US history. The first one was the experimentation that aircraft were under, underwent in the 20s using almost other transaction-like contracting authorities. And then the, uh, you know, that early period in the 50s. And the idea was to make time and experimentation and start looking at blank slates as the way to go. That's the acquisition side of the house and it, and it gets around some of the, um, uh, it's a different pathway. The key thing is going to be is will the department ask for the type, the chunks of money that are necessary for experimentation and have the arguments to the appropriators that yes, we need to experiment like we did and uh, in the 20s and the 50s and achieve those new capabilities for the future. And, and I just don't, I have not seen, they, they, there've been a number of 804s started, number of mid-tiers, that's good. It, but they, you know, they still have the two year, three year lag time to get going because of getting in the budget process. And, and I, they, 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 Bob and I, are, when we were in the, on the Hill, tried to create some a rapid prototyping fund to do this. And that just doesn't exist right now. And that will be the key to see if we're really serious if we start funding that and actually put them toward these mid-tier. Uh, type programs. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and, and comment. It, you know, one of the ideas is you can use these middle tier and then jump them back into the major capability acquisition or what have you, or do multiples of those for different subsystems. But it seems like, you know, it, as you said, it takes two or three years to line up money. So you have to know ahead of time when you are going to be successful and that what that success would enable you to do. And if you don't know you know, what you didn't know two years ago, you're not gonna have the, the money available. So when you break it down, you know, the SAS was talking about more prototyping of subsystems for ships before, you know, you're still gonna, you're gonna create these little miniature valleys of depth between these various stages. Bob, do you want Eric, to Eric, think about that differently, right? Um, so during our time period, compare it to the traditional uh, JSIDs leading into uh, a program of record process. Right. Um, what we were able to do on a number of programs inside DOD is say, hey, don't start it as a program of record. You, you are going to have to wait two years because of the budget process, no matter what you do, because that's the life cycle of the budget process. Right. You have a choice. You can either go through a typical program of record process, which forces you to start with the JSEDS process, which forces you to spend three years coming up with the perfect set of requirements before you ever come to the table for, for the budget. Or you can go right into a middle tier 804 program, skip the entire JSEDS process. Um, you still have to wait the two years, but it's not five years, right? So that was the real benefit of 804 again, didn't have anything to do with the budget process. It had everything to do with the requirements process. Katrina? Well, um, geez, there's so much richness here. <laughs> uh, I would offer to you that um, a couple programs that didn't have 804 utilized the same discussion. Long Range Strike Bomber, the Air Force had invested in s and for years before they decided to drop into the uh, program of record process, if you would, not, not physics, I'm talking process for oversight. So naturally there's tricks to the trade. The challenge is essentially the, the balance, I call it the balance between public good and national security. And that is, is when we need to, like MRAP, we accelerate fast but when we need to have the people have their equities met inside of these programs, they, they slow it down so they can get uh, access to them. 
So to going back to the question that you asked, you know, the whole history of the PLA is for me personally, is, is scary because they do have a fresh slate and they cleaned it out. What's interesting is a different place is the Weimarkt uh, started by basically cleaning out the incumbents to include the process and just created their new slate. I don't see either of those entities being able to be revisioned here. It, it's, it's just not practical. But I do see the, the heightened nature of the environment uh, to our earlier conversation setting us up at least in certain dimensions differently. Um, if we recast our, our undersecretary for R&E into someone who actually had the authorities by virtue of the original NDAA, which is to mature science and technology, it would help us carve off time because reaching that place where there was a, or is a valley of death would be taken off the table because there would be a firmer relationship between those two entities. Um, I think there's ways that we can expedite some of this. Um, and again, I would love to clean slate the process, vice the practice, um, so that people would actually recognize that the practice isn't the problem, it's the people. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Katrina, real quick, because I completely agree with you. And, and this goes all the, back, well, all the way back to Stephen's original question. The PPBS process, what is... What does that mean? It, you start off with asking, what do we need to do? Okay, that's handed to us by the National Defense Strategy. Then we answer the question, okay, well, how are we gonna go about doing that? That's the planning process. And then we turn around and we say, okay, well, what people, equipment, things do we need to do those things? That's the programming process. And then you have the budgeting process that deals with OMB and, and Congress in the language in which they're used to speaking. Those, to Katrina's point about practice, those three fundamental questions of what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, and what do we need to do to accomplish that, we're not going to be able to get away from those questions. There's no organization in the world that doesn't ask those questions of itself on a regular basis. The, to Katrina's point, the, the problem that we're grappling with is the way that we've chosen to implement the mechanisms to answer those questions are fundamentally cumbersome, way too complex and way too detailed. And if we could pull it all up a couple of levels and worry less about the individual uh, specificity of those answers, uh, we could move a lot faster. Yeah, I'd just like to jump in. And of course, exactly what Bob was saying is right. And I would just recommend looking to some of the predecessors of the PBBS for how that was done. You know, in the 40s and 50s, we had the R&D board and the munitions board, where the leaders from those organizations were dual-hatted, sitting on those boards, jointly coming up with how they're going to, from an enterprise view, do programming. Uh, but that wasn't tethered to the budget necessarily, even though it informed the budget. And then you also had, again, I'll bring it back to the interwar Navy, read John Kuhn's book, and there's a, several other good books on it. You know, how did the, inter, you know, the interwar Navy organize itself? And that was another interesting model. So we're coming up on time here. Bill, did you want to just, uh, you know, round us out with a quick thought? No, I, I think just you, you've, you've just really just started to scratch the surface. I think uh, Bob is absolutely right. Uh, those are the questions that need to be answered. I think we need to look at other alternatives. And, and I think there are things out there, uh, capital budgeting or there there are ways that I know the Australians do things differently, may want to look at. And finally, I think in the, in the interim, we probably need to need some, some uh, other accounts that are a little more flexible, that deal with prototyping, that deal with uh, uh, technology mat maturation. Probably at, uh, uh, at, at R&E would be a great place to have that. So uh, anyways, I appreciate you having me here. Thanks. Thanks guys, it's four o'clock here and I uh, appreciate everyone joining us and we have a great panel. There's tons of more questions. I would love to you know, have them on the board for you know, several more hours to talk about this stuff. But um, you know, I appreciate everyone's time. Bill Greenwald, Bob Daigle, uh, Katrina McFarland. I, pre I appreciate everything that you guys are doing and your insights and thanks for joining us today. Eric, Jerry, keep up the good work.
Yeah. Thank you so much, folks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody. Great discussion. Absolutely. And feel free to follow up with us. Uh, we're always interested to hear your feedback. I'll be answering some of these open questions um, on my blog, acquisitiontalk.com. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, we're posting this. Uh, the, the whole recording will be up on our website um, within the next day or two. And you know, please feel, follow, feel free to follow directly. Um, you can go to this um, website or govcon at gmu.edu um, or reach out to Eric or myself directly and uh, look forward to seeing everyone again soon.